մոտ երեսնելու դարի առաջ սկսած է, ուծունյոր դվագանին, եվ շարնակի, որ կրել են դաստին, ալա սեր չէ որոնք է չացավ, � Primeri kristinun tei, jev intruvadzei Amarsaran, Pritschkutian, jev timadzei Skolar Shqipi, Karos Kribengian, Nimar Lutian, jev intruvadzei, vor Vildan, ait kertato qalë, ma jetë svet kërë jërta i rezo afisë, të këtërë së të rapërëru, ait intruvadzei Amar, ait në verë e zënë, ka në gëtë ato qalë. Urem, babe të rrisë, i qanë, shenë kjela, urem e në gjatë këhistë të mkovë, martë me garë, vërë atë e vidi, kërë zavarë nërë, gazë e mbarën dhe dhejanë, në në qenë në qërëllat. Të rrisë sa në të qanë janë e zë, ajo, zavarë asë të këtërës të rakre, asë në këva i. Urem, rrisë kësa gartë, rrisë ka e kanë kumarë nërë masë në kësë vidurët, Qërë së dërva vërat dë bazet, në vëllë vetë e me më mërë bëtë nësë përshka në Amazaran, në bilë veqë qërë së të arejnë, a? Këmarë më mërë bëtë nësë përshka në 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 bëtë nësë Si jem për këtë në gjarën në kësë këmarë, në si në 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 n Kumar jet hatarës nëru hatë që ka. Pa e cilë të orë me gërëna së ku hama e në kitë e pa e në kitë okta gërë dhe dalë, a një ga e me pejnë dhe kërë. Një vasë kërë gazës, me që së më nëzë. Ura men, move forward to... Ok, asë të 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 në fra me county urologist, orange county urologist, to cover of Armenian urology. Ura men, all started in 19... 69, with a question in office in northern Beirut, which was rather than the thing. In October 1997, my wife and I are attending the first or the second gala of the Armenian American Medical Society. When I see Dr. Vartis Najarian, who had just come back from Armenia, come towards me in a Russian with an envelope in his hand. He says, Garo, I stand in Norega. He was the one who helped me in the case. Nu që asik, asa për avera të mëse, vërë onë e të asë, të skësi s'pishë nërë në lashka dhimë. S'pirë ka e, më shakur të e nga bërë, më bide e nga me nëjë. Këtë sa, më ke, paci e raqin e që, bashkë në agan të e zyra, vëra viru me e, vërë ka e, kërë kërës për këna ke e, kërë s'pishë nërë në e, të së të akre vas gardën dhe lak janë, Ora e në dhe në qëtë ka rekord martë më nërë, të vjerë rupë në namaz, e në samaj në barë kësa qëtë janë një qëtë të rabër, asë të avarë rëtjunë. Partë kësin në dhe mërë, dhe dhe janë në desë në mërë, në gërëtës. Në që jasë. Parën dhe dhe janë në e kjerë gjerë dhe jërë, në qëtë 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 Ivan-Dagajanian Por aí, vale ganhar um cartão de jamais nada de chuveiro sal. Eu disse, ok, já me mexe com o meu nome, se der de mim. So, after reading the professor's letter with a seven-page appendix of things they would like me to bring with me for a fruitful visit and productive exchange of information, it became obvious to me that the situation was dire and urgent help was needed. So the next task was to have a plan. I needed to focus on an area where help was most urgently needed in their field of urology. After a quick research, I had by then Armenian patients from Armenia. 
I found out that there was no transurethral surgery in Armenia, which is incredible. Urology depends on transurethral work, endoscopy. We do, we rarely do open procedures, even then, for prostate, for example. And yet, I was told, and that there was no transurethral surgery being practiced in Soviet Armenia. The main reason given for this situation was the unavailability of surgical equipment and training in Armenia. So I was informed that big numbers of Armenian men died every year from prostate problems due to the lack of safe and effective treatment that the transurethral section provides. A tube was placed in the bladder, and most patients lived with it for the rest of their life unless they could go to Moscow or Leningrad to have their prostate surgery. There was a second stage procedure that could be done, but for that, in the system they had, they had to pay. Only emergencies were taken care of, apparently, for Sriyapal, but they had to sort of be nice to the doctor so that they could have that second step, which, by the way, was not a very good technique, and people died from that, too. So, well, I had to find my agenda. I will teach the OR surgery to my Armenian colleagues. That became my motto. Next started the arduous task of collecting the needed equipment and supplies. Local hospitals helped me by donating their older but working instruments. They started calling me the scavenger of their uh, storage areas because I used to go and look what they have that I can use. I would borrow it or take it. And then at the end I bought what I could not find by begging because my project had to succeed. In mid-April of 1987, my young family and I took off to the promised land of Armenia with 18 heavily packed big boxes of everything I needed to succeed. This is LAX, 1987. These are all the boxes, 18 of them, that believe it or not, Air France agreed to fly free of charge. I don't know how. And in this box is a huge bobby machine that uh, was disabled and put aside in our hospital. It weighed like 150 kilos. And it was the great big bobbies. So I had to take that with me because that's key to do transurethral surgery. And it's gently, nicely packed, as you see. And that's Anto from Sidon Travel helping us. And then we arrived to Armenia, in Armenia. I will not describe the emotions and uh, how we accepted the fact that we are in Armenia. It was, for us, incredible. Till now, I get emotional. Because I rarely cried, but that day I was crying, because <clears throat> I was there. So after a couple of rest, uh, days of rest, they took me to this hospital, which had been assigned as the area where we would be doing our work. And it was called the North Emergency Care Hospital, the Stab of Lutian Hospital. We were assigned to work at this hospital, considered to be one of the best in the Republic. I saw a long watch me, surgical colors have reached my tunnels. They took me to the urology room where we were supposed to work, and I was shocked. And I, my first act of uh, instinct was, shall I run away? What's this? You know, the room was humid, moist. There was a window with a broken glass. But I would admit it that a beautiful view of Mount Ararat. That uh, was nice. There was electric wires coming out of the wall, and you know, and that's where we were supposed to work. So I told the uh, guy who was with me, I said, we need to fix this place. It is like Friday, Friday we arrived there. Monday we had to start working. I said, 
But you know, this is what they want. I said, I can't do this. So I said, do you know any people like uh, painters and you know, electricians who can start working? And next thing I know, some of the patients that uh, had admitted to their surgery already started showing up. Barbet Giragos, Barbet Saki, Samen Mehe, Pamanene. Here for Haskinson Hartsu, Balaskan of Rustatsa, Samitan and Bejish John. The sun came, Kachina. Let's say, we have Shaki, let's get in the Shadi. I'm a Kisterian. You ever mean? These guys with their bag in one hand and with their hand clinked, painted, fixed the electric outlet, and by Monday morning it drove us different room. That really reinforced my faith in the system that things get done if the desire to do it is there. And very soon I identified the enemy, which is I'd gone there to fight. The Supra Bibi Capital. what they used to do. They take this big, the guy cannot pee. The process is big. They don't have catheters to put the catheter. They imagine. One of the things in the seven pages, please bring me catheters. Uh, so they had a reel of garden hose. They take a piece, they stick it in. That's the emergency drainage. They suture it in place. And it's from then on up to the patient to take care of it. So I said to myself, all right, we cannot wait to start the war against the Supreme Catheter. We, we collected everything. It was another uh, drama with the fuses uh, blowing up and, you know, we had to bring a transformer that they found in the railway uh, uh, depot from the German army, you know, to up upgrade the electric uh, current anyway to work. To operate that big thing that I had taken. And then we started the conquest of the Supreme Big Capital. And we started working 14 to 16 hours a day because they had filled the whole urology department with patients like that about 30, 40 of them. And then suddenly the calls started coming from the government, from this friend, you know, I have a cousin, you know, and then there are all important people. And then one rule when you go to Armenia, don't get involved in their internal arrangements. Stay out. Don't say, no, this is not right. This is, it's their society, it's their system. It will change. But I have been in situations where doctors from outside, they go and the next day they're teaching them how to behave. That doesn't work. So basically, I started doing the transcendental surgery. I was doing it. And then the doctors, and I chose a few of the competent doctors to train. And there is this uh, <coughs> optical cable, you see? There was no video at that time that you could look on the monitor. There was this two, that you, one, is the student looking at it, and then the other end is in front of the surgeon, and, the, and it's not a very good system, but that's the only system. The light gets reduced by 50% coming out of the patient, and then it gets reduced another 20, 25% reaching to the observer. So it's a slow, tedious process, but that's the only way for them to see what we are doing in there. So we started teaching transurethral surgery uh, through a teaching scope, as I showed you, and 
the bottom line is that in eight working days, we did 52 TORPs. And each one of them was not small because to get to the detention stage, they have waited too long. And what happened is that, uh, this is, uh, these are now the tidbits, it was condominium, you know, everybody's coming, where is this American doctor, you know, where are these instruments, the director of the hospital is coming, the other professors are coming, it's, it's news. And then the day came when we had to do our first surgery. Suddenly everybody disappeared, except for the professor. And then he's asking me, Garojan, Oscar Namanal, Arajan Yana, Ayastani Kulkhavor, Urologa, Inzi Garasenegor, it made us think that I ran to my mistake. Or the nominal, you see, in charge of me, Sarah Garajan, it is. Therefore, Rus Pishnere will come. Itinerary surgeons. In a squad, if they're preparing for money, they operate. And they would not allow the Armenian students to be in the room so that they would not learn. That's imperialism for you. That's, you know. So we had a system that each professor first looks 15 minutes, the next one, the next one, and then by doing this they got an idea of what we're doing. By the way, it takes us three years to do this regularly, you know, in the residency programs. But over there there is no chance, there is no time to waste. People are dying. So, so that is the third day. The roles are reversed. The Armenian doctor is sitting there, we don't see him, he's doing the procedure already. And now I am watching through that teaching scope that they then created like a scar on my face because it was heavy. Mm -hmm. And then, and this lady was so dedicated her name was Arevik. She knew something about scopes and things from Russia. She had worked. She never left that room as long as we were there. You know? She had a family, she had kids. Arevik, she don't come. No, no, yes, she I missed her. So basically, this was mission accomplished for that little, little question. Because at the end, I found out, I, I thought that they had competent enough to do this, plus over there they don't have, sorry, the malpractice environment, so if one or two problems will happen, that's the cost of teaching, you know, and fortunately they did very well. By the eighth day, they were already doing it by themselves, and it's history already that uh, thousands of TORPs have been performed since 1987, all across Armenia and Artsakh. My biggest gift was about five years later, or six years later, we do, started doing conferences about 10 years. And then one year there was this keynote speech, blank, to be given by Dr. Fanarjan, one of our residents. What's this mystery, you know? He says, oh, sit down and you will find out. So he gave the first accounting of 2,500 TORPs they had done in those years in seven or eight localities in Armenia. Because I will show you that we also went to the outside uh, cities to train them. And then we got, started getting more ambitious. They said, Dr. John, he went to for medicine, he went to the school, he Bring, bring her, bring, bring him, you know. And this is that uh, case. And this is a very iconic picture because they're both dead now. This is Professor Arjanya, the professor who I had given great credit for making this happen. You know, this man was very strong personality, but he was also a visionary. And uh, I never forget when the first day we went to that Norki hospital, we went to his office. He got his keys, he opened the door, and they gave them to me. He says, Prishtya Tsaryan Sat, 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 Tsaryan
I'm not ashamed. That was huge. So a complex kidney cancer surgery is being performed with the help of two senior Armenian neurologists, Professor Arjanian and Professor Havandestadurian. He, he was the chief neurologist of that hospital, and as a courtesy, we allowed him to participate. Well, we had a little time to go and visit Behapar. He gave us his blessings. And this is uh, my young family at that time. My wife, Sylvie, Tali, Naram, and Professor Arjanian. So on April 24th, we're still work, we're working. We don't know whether it's holiday or not holiday. We have to work because we have to do all these cases. Suddenly, one of the doctors comes and says, Doctor, we have to go to Bursa uh, once you're there. I said, why? He says, because this is, they want to, to be there for a ceremony. And I was not dressed up, you know, I was working. I put on something, I had no coat. So they put me in this car and they brought me. And then, this is that lucky one. Christian, whatever I would say, dream. And he called one of the KGB guys, he says, but where are good to? So this is not my where are good. KGB guy freezing out there, but uh, you know, it, it was cute. Now, this is when my eyes opened up in what it means to have a country. Okay? Until then, we're still working, we're too busy. But when you go there and you feel the power, when you feel the power of being on your own land, honoring your history, hundreds of thousands of people perish parading by, whereas in the best of our efforts in the diaspora, if you can get a thousand people who are so happy, that's the answer. You need a strong country if you want to survive as a nation. And that day I was very emotional and, you know, I was remembering um, our uh, martyrs, my, uh, you know, the Urfa, the Rosa Mart, everything came like a movie in front of my eyes. And I gave thanks to what we had. And what we had was Soviet Armenia at the time that we had grown up neutral about it. At least certain we did not know the country, you know. I mean we did not touch the country. We did not all we used to have in our homes, Mount Ararat picture, uh, Yerevan picture, and that was Armenia. The Cold War was still uh, there. But all it takes is go there and put your foot down on the ground and see your people, your, your soul. Doesn't matter who is in charge. That's what Baron Bratsian used to tell us. You know, Simon Bratsian was my teacher in Jemaran. He used to say, doesn't matter who is the government, kids. I stand there. I guess with that they say, well, they will, I think Kakade or Anakche, I'm in Chore. I know this one. But I mean, uh, this was just a little interlude. And then uh, Lili Jean, the professor's, uh, professor's uh, retreat, that's what the second weekend that I took one day off. And then after, uh, I never went to Badenatoran, I never saw anything except that hospital uh, door. But, and I was very exhausted because every day we used to work 40, 16 hours. And then suddenly we had to have dinner, all the bottles was open, you get to your hotel the next day at 7, they're, they're already bit. okay. All I remember is sitting in the airplane and said, when are, when are we coming back? No. After that first visit. The next visit was in October 88, and already Armenia was changing. And you know, we had the privilege to uh, witness all this. The Red Army was already occupying the uh, Rabarak. These are pictures taken from our hotel room in Armenia Hotel. And then we were told that there are other things happening in the city. You know, there was no newspaper, there was no TV coverage, but they said around, oh, on the opera there is things happening. So my wife managed to go to the opera with a friend and the Galapagomide was already starting their demonstrations. 
This is Hachik Istanbulian. My wife interviewed Fana Siladerian. We took a lot of pictures and we brought with us and we gave them to Apo I don't remember, for us, and they kept bringing them. So I remember my son, um, he used to go to this soldier standing there and go home, Russian, go home. I said, come here, what are you doing? Or maybe you can ask them, Achia. And then I, I returned that in that October from that visit very positive. I said, you know, things are changing. Armenia is on the verge to become independent. You know, I could feel that something is not is going to happen. And then the earthquake hit. And it was uh, unexpected, of course. And uh, I was, I joined the State Department uh, emergency rescue uh, team at the request of the State Department and with the agreement of our community leaders here. Dr. Najarian and uh, Luis Simon was also with us. And uh, when you go and see the destruction, you just cannot believe what nature can do. And then I was amazed on how the influx of Armenian physicians from everywhere who came and to lend a hand to those uh, victims. My thought is that the earthquake of 1988 resulted in, a major, in major changes in Armenia's healthcare with a massive infusion of medical technology, information, and put Armenia on the map. Because every newspaper, every media journal, this is the nephrology news and issue, and that's me on the top cover. And those are my pictures. They, co they covered huge coverage of the Armenian uh, earthquake, but then through that, Armenia suddenly became exposed to all kinds of technology, you know, ultrasound, uh, dialysis machines. This uh, article talks about dialysis uh, machines. There was no dialysis machine in the, before, you know, and then, I'm not saying it's good, but at least this was one side effect of the earthquake that I think helped the healthcare advance in Armenia a little faster than it would have otherwise. So what happened after two years of working at NORC, the ambient of the urology moved to Vikarian uh, Surgical Institute which was not an Armenian hospital. It was uh, built with the money of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Professor Mikhailian had connections and he had arranged the funding to build this hospital. And he had established a cardiac program already and that he had made some cardiac surgeries. And he was very ambitious and he wanted his hospital to be the center of specialized medicine, surgical uh, specialties. And he welcomed the Ambion from Stavok uh, to to this hospital, which started in 1989. And the idea was that he would build a building separate, because he saw in two years already, urology is making some moves, you know, there is a lot of enthusiasm. All the students want to apply to urology, and then he said, I am willing to build a building or a separate uh, structure for urology, make it the Urology Institute of Armenia or something like that. Unfortunately, the collapse of the system or the collapse of the government never allowed that to happen. But he was a remarkable man and he is always remembered as a leader and a visionary. This is again our journey and myself. The picture is not very good. Now, in 1990, it's a weekend, they're telling me that there is a kid in the Aradian touched, he has kidney disease and he needs a transplant. I said, what? Because they heard that I do transplants. Do you have a transplant program here? No. Do you have a donation system? No. So how are you going to do it? Good luck, good luck. Here you come with your parents, then you got it. 
Telegram. So I didn't ask, how do you do it? How? I said, you know, they're uh, joking with me, you know? So we are in uh, the professor's uh, Russia for the weekend. The phone rings, it says the kidney is here. So apparently in Leningrad they had a hospital, I don't know, that had donors waiting to be donated, to, to, do, to become donors, and they would match them before even the kidneys were removed. So this Russian doctor comes in with a Tupperware in his back, brings the kidney. And then in the States here, you know, that's all a specialty to how to remove the kidney, how to save it. And I'm stuck. I said, okay, let's go and see what we can do. Meanwhile, there is no electricity. There is no hot water reliably. And here it is, we are scrubbing with alcohol because we're going to do a kidney transplant. And we went, we did it. Sometimes we had to use uh, flashlights during the case because the electricity would come and go. And I was saying, uh, good luck, you know, this kidney will not even, believe me, in 15 minutes it's spurting urine. And I was saying, God, thank you. <laughs> because this was the kid, this was the kid in the ICU. Okay, that's the ICU of Mikhailian, which is the best hospital, right? It was a shepherd, and he died a few years later, not from the jet, but from uh, the kidney not working. He couldn't afford medication, the cyclosporin and all that. So he died from... Uh, till today, uh, there is transfer uh, program in Armenia, but it's uh, based only on live donors. There is no... Uh, law for uh, cadaveric organ donation and that's another job they have to do if they want to do more transplants. And this is and what happened, the earthquake resulted in a lot of shock to the kidneys and a lot of young people like these lost their kidneys and suddenly they became the, the dialysis patients and they used to live in the hospital because they're from the villagers, you know, to, it's not hard for them, it's not easy for them to, so they used to live in that uh, hospital in this in, uh, just to be dialyzed and they had no life. So well, another idea of Mikhail was to start a transplant program at that time, which was, again, that didn't, never happened when he was alive. So the first 10 years can be characterized as mainly teaching of new surgical techniques, long hours in the operating room, I call it the years in the trenches securing new instruments. And I was, you know, when the earthquake happened, there was fundraising, earthquake fund, etc. So I was given some money from ARS to buy new equipment for Mr. Mikhailian's uh, cystoscopy suite. And another co competitor gave me $10,000. That is the only money that I have collected. Uh, I didn't solicit. And we made a lab, audiovisual uh, lyric center I will show you. We designed a urology residency program. They did not have a residency program. They had mentorship. In other words, if some young guy can convince a professor to be his student, he, he gets mentored, and then after that, the professor vouches for that kid that if he's really good, then he can go to Moscow, and he can do one or two years of some kind of a fellowship. We put the, down the urology residency, a program in the beginning it was two years, now it's three years, based on Western models and standards. We translated and promoted the use of clinical guidelines in neurological uh, uh, practice because we wanted the whole country to follow the same rules. Not in Gumri do a certain kind of treatment and then the other one they do a different. We wanted to. And then we provided teaching materials and establishment of an audiovisual learning center, as I said. Urfaya and Museum. In late 1990s, the Mikhailian Institute of Neurology was the Armenian Association of Urology was founded. And that was a very, very important step to get credibility vis-a-vis -vis donors, vis-a-vis -vis other professional organizations, and also for self-esteem of the local urologists that they belong to a professional society. And the first international conference on neurological cancers 
with the as faculty was in 1998, and I'll show you that's a very iconic uh, uh, event. The first annual congress of the Association of Urology was in 1999, and it has happened every year to today. This year is the 21st or 22nd. It always happens the last weekend in September, over there, they know they go. And it's, attendance is mandatory for the urologists if they want to keep their licensure current. Uh, there, was there is increasing participation of Armenian urologists of two international meetings. Like now, for them, it's nothing to go to Europe, to anywhere to attend. They learn English already. They present papers, you know. That was a good move. And also, we organized training by WI, training visits of uh, promising Armenian residents to US, to Europe, by pro providing shelter, I mean, providing room, board, and also training opportunities. At one time, my house was called Hotel Yerevan, Hotel Armenia, because they used to stay with us. You know, the professor came for three months and he was our guest. So this is the very, very first academic activity that uh, was organized. Uh, this is Dr. Captain Bristol, who was a colleague of mine uh, in Orange County, medical oncologist. And this is at the Army Shabazian, he was, uh, he is a radiation oncologist. They came and we did a very successful conference and then we introduced for the first time the idea of giving certificates for it, of attendance so that they can show that they are, have been uh, studying and learning. And in this picture are some of today's urology leaders when they were students or just studying. This little guy here behind to, today is the chief urologist of Armenia, Dr. Arthur Grabsky. And he's also a very good administrator, he runs that place very well. This is Dr. Sergei Fanarjan, a very bright, very good urologist that he works at uh, uh, Erepuni and Mikhailian and many others. Then, year after year, we started doing these conferences, and you will notice that this is the second one. It's a little uh, homely, you know, the banner is uh, made locally. And then as we progress, you see more professionalism. This is 2002 already. And for the first time, we have a European representative from the European Association of Urologists. Oh. This uh, gentleman here, who spent half a day lecturing and uh, you know, bringing the latest uh, state of the art to the Armenian urologist. And since then, every, every year, we have a contract or arrangement with the European Association of Urology that one day, before or after the Armenian conference, they will do what we call a school of urology, which is like a hands-on course. They, they, they demonstrate new techniques, they bring the equipment with them, sometimes they leave it there, they donate it, so it's a great uh, relationship we have with them. In 2016, the lecturer was the president of the European Association of Urology, which is a big vote of confidence that this country can accept him, can uh, value his services, and uh, his name is Dr. Chappell, and it was an extremely uh, successful uh, uh, conference that year, and we all, all, always, uh, celebrate the end of the uh, meeting by having a party at one of the local places. And that night, 
everyone was in a very, very high mood because they also had to see the laser that I will show you. And then I was sitting with somebody, and then suddenly I see these throngs of doctors coming towards me. Kavor, Kavor. <laughs> but to, you know, that's where I got the designation of being the cover of urology in 2016. This is the conference room of the Ismailian Medical Center. Look at that. I mean, you know, I don't. It's state of the art. It is wired for close circuit with TV. So when I go and I want to demonstrate a new surgery, like lasers or female urology, they can watch it live from the operating room to the conference room. And I don't think that we have this in many of our hospitals. As I told you, when Mikhail Nam got sold in 2009, and the guy who bought it was not a very reputable person, he was a good surgeon, but he did, not, he did do nothing with that hospital which went downhill. So, my commitment had been to Mikhail from 1990 to 2004, 2003, but the place got so bad that I didn't have the heart to go back there and continue. The good news is that about two years ago, towards the end of the uh, of Cesar Christian's uh, regime, the government, the Yerevan State Medical University, in partnership, bought back the Kairian to turn it into a university teaching hospital. And the rector, who is a very active virologist, Dr. Armin Moradian, in less than one year, has completely renovated the hospital. When you go to Yerevan, you have to see it. And they also have a Zimbori, an Christian wound there, where they do state-of-the-art rehabilitation for the wounded soldiers, and also they do it for the private. So that's the new uh, conference hall of the Mikaelian Teaching Hospital, where last year's conference was held. And now that we have a center, most of the uh, ambulance or chairs that are scattered all over the city. Orthopedics is in Erepuni, uh, urology is in uh, wherever, and all coming home to the teaching hospital. So since from other visits, you know, every time I go, I always lectured. This, even before we started the conferences, it was important for me to communicate uh, what's going on in the real world. In my honor, a few years later, they, no, they named the urology section at Mikhailian, the Garotet Sengyan, Yetron, or uh, Pajin. So this is that learning center that uh, I was able to realize. And then, gradually, we built it up with computers and uh, CDs and videos. These are my whole collection of the Journal of Urology that I sent over there, and they read, they learn. And then, not only Yerevan has been my center of interest, I have been, uh, I have gone to Gimri, Yerepuni uh, Hospital, and Republican Hospitals. And this is, imagine, 30 years ago, an Armenian made laser that they <laughs> The inventor had it, and nobody wanted to test it. They were scared it will explode. I said, bring it over, let's try it. And then we did the first laser, bladder tumor uh, destruction with laser. I think this is like 1992, something like that. And then we have grateful patients. Uh, this is, uh, this guy had five years of it at two, and then we removed it, he couldn't believe it. He's a composer, I think his name is Mirzoyan, right? The uh, you know this guy? This is his LP of his last symphony. And this one, not ask me, is what is it? Or another call. They said to me, you know, this guy you know, is important for us. I said, why? He says, he's helping the Arapa world. Like, you can't believe it, you know. Let's help him. His name was Rafi. I said, fine, if it's good for Armenia, it's good for me. You know? And we did his surgery, he was happy. He got killed by somebody a few months later. 
and on the day of his funeral, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia stopped so that airplanes could fly in and bring in all his friends for his funeral. And then the moment they left, the war restarted. So that's, and that's, real, that's a real story. Now, you start a transition of period of beefing up or uh, expanding our abilities. And that requires equipment, technology, which is expensive, and they are not there at the point, at this point where they can have $300,000 for a laser, $1 million for a visa trip there unless they can get one. So I said, let's see what we can do. The proctology hospital was uh, closed down. Why? Because when they did the unfortunate uh, privatization of the hospitals, I call it that, I don't know what it's what do you think? The, privatiz the privatization of the hospitals in the late 90s created a new situation for healthcare in Armenia. New centers emerged and prospered. Those who were bought by uh, responsible people who were ready to invest their money and other people's money to promote new ideas, like Eriopunia Hospital, Nairi, those hospitals, they did well. But other hospitals like Number 8 Hospital or uh, Bikarian, they only wanted money and nothing else, and they deteriorated. So as I said, they were stagnating, there was no morale, and at the same time, HBU, I don't know how or why, took over the proctology hospital. They got in, in, in the healthcare to be fleeced by the doctors because they didn't change anything. They uh, kept the same guys who had been in the system. And the Louis Simon got tired of it and went to Beapa. He says, I have this hospital for free. Do you want it? And Beapa, knowing him, he likes building, he likes uh, expansion. He said, Sure. And that's when Surp Nurses Hospital was created, when HMAZ took over. At this, they say it's moral uh, responsibility, but I don't know what it is. But all I know that it was good for healthcare. Why? Because it is a very progressive place. You know, the moment they made the change, those guys who were in the way of progress left because they thought that they cannot work for cash anymore. Because the Vayapa put his foot down and says, no more cash, no more under targets. Everybody goes on a payroll. We have to pay taxes, and they do. All the prices are announced you know, on boards. So, soup nurses lasted for about three, four years. And that's when I got involved with them, because they called me. They said, Gala, we want to start the urology program at soup nurses. They don't have urology. What do you think? I said, great idea. But who are you going to put there? You know, I mean, they have to put some good person. So after trying a couple of people, they settled finally with Dr. Grabski. And so when I went there, they already they were functioning, but they had no equipment. So we're making rounds, and then all these guys have prostate problems, they have a nodule, they have a high PSA, they need to have a biopsy. And I said, scheduling for biopsy. That's what I do in my office. And then these guys look at each other because they're annoyed. I said, what's the problem? We cannot do biopsy. We don't have an ultrasound. The only ultrasound is the ex-minister of health got it in his private place, and he won't allow urologists to come in to do the biopsy. I said, no, no, no. The moment I came back, I had an extra ultrasound, which I revamped completely. I put it on the plane and send them. Here it is. I said, you have your ultrasound, start working. Get training, and I want every man who qualifies to benefit from this uh, machine, whether they can pay or not. I, I, that's my condition, and they complied. And that machine is still working. But the real cooperation with uh, International Corporate Donors started a little later uh, 
personal contacts with major international corporations, significant donations of state-of-the-art medical equipment has been achieved since 2010, allowing urologists in Armenia to expand the scope of their services to their patients. The following are some examples of the most valuable and highly appreciated gifts to Armenian urology. Is Miriam Medical Center, Hospital Number no. 1 in Yerevan, Arachi Nivantanos, and the new Mikhailian Teaching Hospital have already received donations of medical equipment to the ultimate benefit of their patients. I'll show you some of the examples of those donations that we have been able to get. This is a stone light uh, laser, chromium, to break up stones. That's a standard of care. They didn't have it. And all the story goes, I was at the AUA conference uh, in San Diego in, towards the end of 2009, where I went to the boot of this Heltronics uh, Corporation from Texas. And uh, I met a nice man. And then they had one of these sitting there. I said, oh, how much are these? He says, for whom? I said, I want to give it as a gift to someone. And I know that's serious because, you know, you don't want to have a rural center without a home laser. He says, tell me more about it. So I start telling him my story. You know, I, you know, I've been going to Armenia 20 years, blah, blah, blah. He says, okay, give me your card. So I get my card. Like two months later, he calls me. He says, where is this going? We're ready to uh, pack it. Oh, before that, he had called me and said, what's the electricity there? I said, you know, it's 110, whatever. He says, we're ready to uh, pack this and ship it. And I said, oh. And then I said, so how much are we going to, you know? He says, no. It's an appreciation of what you do and you want to be part of that. His name is uh, Mr. Kozan. I have his picture. That was the beginning. Not only they donated it, a brand new 30, 40,000 or more machine, they packed it and they flew it, you know, an unheard of. And over there, they like ceremony, so every time they get the new equipment, they bless it. That's the Tepsil Pazan. That's the first director of the uh, Sultan says. Uh, what's his name? For, from the. Seva uh, Gabbad. Seva Gabbad. Seva Gabbad. Seva Gabbad. Seva Gabbad. Seva Gabbad. And that's Arthur Gilapsi, the. And I don't know who this guy is, and that's me. Now, when they bring these machines to our hospitals, there is a technician that comes with them. You know, they know what button to push, and you know. Now I said, oh, I'm going there, I'm giving this machine, I don't know how to use it. So I flew to Texas for two days. And then they trained me on the machine. So it was a few buttons, but it was a nice trip. They have good food there. So okay. I came back. And then this machine still works. And here we're talking to the te laser technician, uh, assemb cleaning, assembling it, and already demonstrating say, surgery right away. And it's day and night when you start using a laser. You don't want to use this old machine uh, instruments, this uh, biopsy, you know. You don't look back. Now, in 2012, we get a Revolix laser. Because Gary knew that you don't have a laser for his prostate operations. So I said, are you doing lasers there? I said, no, but how come the number one laser guy in Orange County and you allow them to do? I said, they don't have one. He says, no, no, they do. I, I, have, I have one for you. He sends it. Is it the same guy? Uh, Health Runnings Corporation. And then, that same day we start doing uh, surgeries, that's the machine, I don't even know how much it retails, I don't ask. And that's Dr. Arne Moradian is uh, watching and I'm doing the demonstration. 
the big fish was this little tipter, which, which was a gift between stores and Hedronics. They partnered to donate this $1.2 million machine to Ismilia to break up stones. And then this is uh, the, the opening ceremony of that machine, of the, of the cyber. And this is that, that benefactor, <coughs> Gary Kozan. Yeah. I invited him to, to Armenia with his girlfriend, now his wife, to thank him. And they fell in love with Armenia. And he's the first guy who sends me information about Armenia when something important happens. <laughs> you watch it. <laughs> That's Dr. Uh, Richard Babaya from Boston. Two, two years ago, he was the president of the American Neurological Association. So this picture is interesting because Arthur is the president of the Armenian Association of Urology at that time, the county urologist, and the cover. That was, ah, that was covered three years later. And Dick, this is powerful. You know, I mean, Armenia is attracting power, uh, good guys, and. And that, that's just the beginning. So, you can't go on and on and on. All I can say is that today, urology <laughs> in Armenia is uh, probably what the Kabul? Kabul? Godfather. Godfather. <laughs> this is a recent picture from uh, Vanardi, which is when I celebrated my 70th birthday with my team urology from Izmirnia. Imagine that there is such teams at every big hospital in Armenia who are very proud and very uh, hardworking and uh, providing good care to our people. Yeah. Yeah. So to conclude, These are the founders of modern army neurology. Professor Bokpatsyal, he died three years ago from ill health. And myself, before, of, that's a plaque, like biographic of mine. We were with great vision, with great uh, persistence. <coughs> and I also have to admit that at no time we had any difficulty from the ministry, from the government, from the corrupt oligarch, whatever we do. As long as you do your job, you put, don't put your nose in personal affairs. You don't get too loud, loud with politics. Which is pretty short, I don't care. Okay. I have other things to do and to show up, okay? That's my wife who has been behind me. The woman behind the man, also called Mayrik. You know, all these doctors who came to our house would call it Mayrik, and then she doesn't like it. I said, that's in Armenia a nice part of Shaka. Part of Shaka, part of Shaka, love it. And she's a dedicated supporter of my work from day one. There are years where I used to go by myself when our kids were very young, and she never complained. So, what is what can we conclude? Or, uh, so the, so the outreach has consisted of annual visiting professorships since 1987. In the early phases, we established modern neurological operating rooms in at Mikhaelian with the help of ARS sponsorship, in, which was like twenty-five thousand dollars from the earthquake fund. From 1994, we accomplished the replacement of all endoscopic instruments that needed to be replaced with, in Alza, Gimli, and Manasor. In 1990, the Audiovisual Learning Center was established at the Bikhaerian. And from 1987 to present, there is ongoing support with donation of educational materials, computers, medical equipment, educational assistance to the residents, like we paid a couple of us for corresponding membership to our residents and the young doctors to access the Urology University of the, the website of the American Neurological Association, which is a 
probe of information, you know, all kinds of data that they need. Active participation in any urology conferences and online consultations, etc. Armenian urology has achieved great progress in the last 30 years, and the quest for higher levels of excellence continues. It is considered to be one of the best and respected surgical subspecialties in Armenia. The input of diaspora Armenian urologists has greatly contributed to this progress. Oh. To be fair, there have been other urologists except other than me that periodically have come and have contributed their effort, and we need to remember them. The success of this project is a good example of a successful Armenia diaspora cooperation based on mutual respect, <coughs> trust, and the common goal of achieving excellence. Every individual can make a big difference. Thank you.